I'm delighted to have with us Dr. Sarah Hodges, Associate Professor at the Department of History in the University of Warwick. Sarah Hodges, welcome to News Click. You worked on the reproductive health in, of, in Tamil Nadu. You read and write Tamil fluently. Your first book was called Contraception, Colonialism and Commerce, Birth Control in South India, 1920 to 1940. Can you tell us briefly what were your major findings? Well, certainly the starting point of the study was looking at the question of birth control in colonial India. I think many people are familiar with the uh, history of family planning in India as a post-independence phenomenon, something that the independent Indian state took up. In many ways, the point of the book was to engage with the colonial history of birth control, and that meant two things. One was that it was not, family planning was not a policy that the colonial state pursued at all. Uh, we have many instances in uh, the 19 teens and certainly into the 1920s uh, where Indians make uh, representations to government saying, can you not include contraception as part of your public health program? And they say no, largely because they feel it is simply too controversial. They don't want to stir up trouble for themselves. So that's the first thing. The history of birth control in colonial India is not actually a colonial project. The second thing is that really uh, birth control was taken up as part and parcel uh, by uh, certainly some constituencies as part of the social reform movements. Uh, but within this, we see two perhaps surprising things. One is that the main, in the Tamil Nadu case in colonial Madras, the main drivers behind organizing contraception for women largely, although not only, were men. And the second was that the people who were pursuing uh, largely the importation of uh, contraception for women were not also part of the social reform movements. So some were, but not all. How did the uh, non-Brahmin movement mm. in Tamil Nadu contest Malthusian claims? Mm. Well, in the Madras setting, there were really two groups who were, uh, uh, although not in dialogue with one another, engaging uh, in importing contraception and in uh, informing people about its availability. The first, of course, was the self-respect movement. Now, they were less engaged in uh, uh, importation, but uh, within the movement's 1920s and 1930s history, one of their major programs was self-respect marriage as a way to eradicate caste. And, of course, as you're familiar with, uh, one of the things that happens at a marriage, particularly a self-respect marriage, is speech giving. And many of these speeches, the chief guest and the honored speaker would say that in order for a couple to have a revolutionary family life, a self-respecting family life, that they each actually needed to be free. And to be free meant in many ways, particularly for women, to be free of the constant burden of childbearing. So there was a very radical, uh, quite emancipatory feminist agenda, I think, at the heart of the self-respect movement's uptake of uh, contraception in terms of as, as a uh, uh, self-conscious policy. On the other hand, you had uh, the Mylapur set, who were uh, largely chief court justices, one Vepa Ramesan, and many chief court uh, lawyers, who were part of something that started in Madras in the 1920s called the Madras Neo-Malthusian League. And now what was particularly interesting, it was said, of course, that uh, in order to have your cases heard favorably, you were meant to join this league. And so many people, it's claimed or perhaps joked, uh, joined it out of professional advancement. It was started by two men. Um, one had 13 children and the other had none. And so it was claimed that of the uh, uh, birth control movement, one of the founders knew nothing of birth and the other nothing <laughs> of control. However, having said this, what the, the Mylapur set was, um, certainly not everyone was embracing contraception and importing and organizing uh, dispensaries where it was available, or rather uh, chemist shops. 
but of those who were, it was also simultaneously advanced at a time when practices of uh, child marriage were under review. So what we see these men arguing is not that contraception for women is a radical emancipatory agenda, but actually something, the problem with child marriage isn't children getting married, or rather girls. The problem with child marriage is girls having babies too early. So they were very interested in promoting contraception as a way to maintain the practice of child marriage without its so-called deleterious uh, uh, non-eugenic effects. Today, mm -hmm. you have, uh, you've been working on contemporary public health issues, stem cells, cord blood banking, medical waste, what factors shape this fascinating transformation? You would agree most historians prefer to stick to archives. Some do. <laughs> uh, I think as an historian, trained as an historian, uh, I certainly have always been interested in the contemporary articulation of historical phenomena. So it is, uh, I think what the historian brings to the study of the present is a deep skepticism about claims of the new. And perhaps you would agree that as we survey what's been happening in India over the past 10, 20 years, many times people are very strident in their claims that this is new, we've not seen this before. So I think what the historian can bring is a slightly longer view to claims of the new around that. Having said that, however, certainly uh, when I began to, in conversation with you and other colleagues, pay closer attention to the contemporary re-articulation of the politics of health under liberal reforms, I simply couldn't stop thinking about it. So I hope to uh, marry the two, the past and the present, in a sort of critical, if constructive, dialogue. Uh, coming to cord blood banking in Chennai, uh, what factors explain the rise of what you have called the fantasy of the stem cell? Mm. Well, the fantasy of the stem cell, although my research has been based in contemporary Chennai, uh, the fantasy of the stem cell is certainly a worldwide phenomenon. And I think there are a few things. Of course, stem cells uh, as a medical therapeutic are things that have come online as a possibility really in the past few decades. So they are quite new. There are several things that are noteworthy about them. One is the claims, the incredibly speculative claims that are being made about what stem cells can or cannot do. They are, in short, being talked about by people from within the community of uh, doctors and hematologists as well as outside. They're being talked about as a miracle cure. So I think, you know, we all want something for nothing. The second thing is uh, the rise of the fantasy of the stem cell is very much part and parcel of a new way of understanding the possibilities for limitless growth. So what is special about stem cells, what makes them therapeutically useful, claimed, is that they are able to reproduce themselves over and over again, a kind of eternal life. Uh, elixir of youth and at the same time we see economic doctrines that are very keen to reproduce economic growth and those two things I think have come together in a very salutary way. Dr. Hodges, you refer to families exploiting what you call their collective genomic capital mm -hmm. in banking cord blood but then as you explain what is not spoken about here is not only the role of speculative finance but death. I think this erasure is really quite fascinating. We don't speak of surplus extraction in reproduction, nor do we see surplus extraction here. Can you explain the presence of this absence to our listeners? Ah, well, um, the way in which people make money off of stem cells is of course through claiming that it's going to continue forever. So that there's both speculation about the biomedical uh, prospects of what stem cells tend to deliver, but this is also the foundation in many cases of venture capital in fueling the biotech industry. So that is one thing there. On the other hand, you have uh, families in many cases, joint families, who are look after, looking after their children's marriages in ways that are meant to maximize the family's potential, both 
in terms of its biological strategies that of continuing the line quite literally as well as in its financial strategies that we have to continue the perpetuation of money as uh, one of my colleagues reminds me there can be no joint family without a family joint the, the things that keep uh, often um, uh, very commercial families together is that there is a kind of family business and we have to extend it. So those two things come together in the project of certainly private stem cell banking in Chennai. Uh, but uh, as the mm. point you emphasize, of course, is that what is mm. foregrounded here is hope. Absolutely. And uh, what is missing here is the possibility of death. Now, I should say that in terms of the stem cell banking, uh, the state of play with it in Chennai and, of course, across India, is that there is no national cord blood bank. And what, stu or what uh, uh, families are invited to do is when uh, a daughter or daughter-in-law is uh, expecting, as part of the antenatal treatment, they are informed about uh, the possibility of either donating or privately banking their the baby's umbilical cord blood because it is claimed by the firms that do this that it is a kind of insurance for the future. Now, what is made less clear, I think, to these families is that if the child in question develops a disorder, particularly a blood disorder, which is for the moment, what umbilical cord blood cells can treat, the child itself can't use its own blood because it, of course, has the same disorder, the blood, uh, cord blood cells. So that is one thing. The other thing is what is very striking in the ways that uh, cord blood firms market their services to families is that they are actually marketing to them to the family. We can get this, uh, she is going to have the child, and when the child comes, we can also take the cord blood. Now that may seem a very straightforward thing, but what is effected in that story is that we are going to get something from nothing. This cord blood is a waste. We are going to just, you know, put as uh, gynecologists and obstetricians say, we're just going to throw it in the bucket. Why not save this remarkable thing? Now, what I think is occluded in that is that actually cord blood is not waste, that stem cells don't come from just anywhere. As a colleague of mine likes to remind me, they don't grow wild in the forests. They come from one place currently, and that is women's bodies. So effectively, what uh, is happening in this is that the woman is being harnessed both through a logic of neoliberal capitalism as well as through the logic of the patriarchal family in which her body is the family's capital, both through the child but also through the possibility of stem cell harvesting. You are working now also on medical waste, mm -hmm. placentas, embryos, is there a trade in these and how big is this trade? Hmm. Uh, well, there has for uh, certainly the last 50 years, if not slightly more, been a trade in placental waste. Uh, and that is an international trade in which international pharmaceutical companies have bought placental waste for use in uh, cosmetic products face creams, the rest, as a youth-giving substance, which I think is perhaps not as well known as it might be. Uh, embryonic stem cells and, and the trade in embryos, although it's not something that I have looked at particularly closely, there has been very good work documenting the collusion between a trade in embryos, particularly for stem cell therapeutics, and the assisted reproductive technology industry, in which women are, as it were, incentivized to donate some uh, IVF-derived and other kind of ART-derived eggs yes. uh, or embryos uh, as a way to um, defer the costs of their fertility treatments. India is emerging now, they say, as a hub of mm. reproductive health tourism. Do you think this needs to be regulated, controlled, and how? Mm. How is this to be done? Well, to be frank, I have a great deal of ambivalence and conflicting feelings about uh, what I read about the possibilities of regulation. Certainly there are some groups who have done excellent work, particularly Sama, uh, investigating what needs to be regulated, what the possibilities for regulation are. So I think we must not give up on the hope of what uh, regulation can deliver. 
But my reservation is that regulation as a state mechanism, whose interests does it uh, protect? And as long as we have in India and elsewhere across the world, certainly in the US we can see it, or UK, any number of places, the state is not always the best guardian, unfortunately, of the people's interests. So to have regulation as a solution to the, in many cases, exploitative relationships between women and assisted reproductive technologies or other forms of reproductive uh, uh, medical treatments, I think there is still some way to go before we can rest easily in the faith that regulation in and of itself uh, can provide us an ethical and a politically sound uh, ground to go forward. I think we're completely running out of time, Dr. Hodges, but this has been really fascinating. Thank, Thank you, you so very much. It's a pleasure. <laughs>